Well, good morning, Boulder Mountain. My name is Kyle. I'm the pastor here. A very special welcome to all of you. If this year a guest, maybe the very first time you've attended Boulder Mountain, just a little bit about our church. We're a church that, where we make disciples as we help people find and follow Jesus. Jesus is a big deal here. We're a Bible church, and if you have any questions, if there's anything I can do for you, even say hello, maybe meet a friend or family member that you invited, I would love to take that opportunity. Maybe after service, we have a photo booth out there. We can linger out there and eat some cinnamon rolls and drink some hot chocolate. Deal? Deal. Well, we are in a series. The last few weeks, we've been walking through this series called With Us, and we're in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23 today. And we've been talking about the never-ending presence of, of Jesus with his people, that he will never leave us. He will never forget about us. He is always with you and I. And today I'm going to do something different. We don't usually do this. If you're able to, would you stand for the reading of God's word today? Matthew chapter one, the text will be on the screen. We have some Bibles provided for you in the back. In fact, if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one and keep it as our gift to you this Christmas. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Before you have a seat, high five, shake a hand next to you and say to them, God is with you. All right, let's not get carried away here. You may, you may be seated. Why did, why did Jesus come? Very clearly it says here, to save people from their sins, to save Kyle from his sins, to save you from your sins. His mission was very, very clear. He came so that you and I might have a relationship with Jesus. Here at Boulder Mountain, we believe no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God loves you, and he has a plan for your life, and he knew that you were going to be here today. I've been praying for you. I took some time this morning. I prayed for you today, that you would encounter the living God of the universe who created you, who gave you breath, that you would be reminded that you have a creator God who sees you today and loves you and wants to share something with you today. So I pray that you would walk out of here, all of us would walk out of here today, maybe with something new, a new understanding of, of who God is. As I think about the Christmas story and each of the characters that gathered around the nativity scene, I thought, boy, they all traveled. The Christmas story is really about everyone's traveling, right? You think of every character, name a character, they, they traveled. They were on their way. Think of the wise men traveled probably the longest took a lot of expense, a lot of cost, but they traveled. The shepherds, they were in their fields. They had to get to, they had to, get to the cave. Did they bring their sh herd with them? Probably not. If they were in a hurry, the sheep don't move very fast. So they might have left them. Mary and Joseph were traveling. They, were, they were, had to get to Bethlehem for a census to be taken. Angels definitely traveled quite, quite a long way. Following Jesus requires movement. In fact, Christians throughout Scripture moved a lot. 
traveling. In fact, I would say to all of us here today, we're, we're all traveling. The Bible makes it really clear. We're all just passing through. This world is not our ultimate final destination. We're all just passing through. So we can relate to the Christmas story when it comes to that. But there's, a, there's another travel that I want to bring to your attention, and it's, it's a little unique for today, for Christmas story, but it's, it's found in the book of Psalm. And you can turn there if you want. Otherwise, you can just let me read it to you. Psalm chapter 84. Psalm 84, verses 5 through 7. You may have read this before. You may have heard this before. It can be flyover text sometimes in the Bible. There's text in the Bible where we fly over it. It's not very exciting. It's, I don't understand what it means. And, and so today I'm going to share a few verses from the book of Psalm for all of us. Because we all enjoy God on the mountaintop. When we're traveling, there's been times in our life, in our season, you can share with me some of the highlights of your life. And I like to climb mountains, and I love getting to the top. It's, it's awesome. The view is so much better from the top than it is from the valley. But I'm going to propose most of us, most, most of people... Do not live on the mountaintop. We enjoy God on the mountaintop, but do you know where you really get to know personally God? It's in the valley. It's where we have an intimate relationship with God. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's been times in your life you've come to the end of yourself and you say, I can't do this anymore. I, I've reached the end. I, I want this to go. I'm going to depend on my creator, God. There's times in our lives Christian, where we've depended on, on God. We realize, I am not enough. I need God in my life, and so I lean in and I trust him to do what I cannot do. If you're not a follower of Jesus, there's a good chance you've reached that point in your life as well, a point where you, I can't go anymore. I don't know what to do. I, I've tried to find my purpose in life. I've tried this and that, and I haven't found... If that's you today, we've, we've all been there, but you, that's all you have. You, that's all you have. When you come to the end of yourself, there's nothing and no one to depend upon. I'm going to propose to you that there is someone. His name is Jesus, and he would love to have a personal relationship with you, beginning maybe for the first time today. The passage in Psalm... I'm going to read to you is a valley moment. A valley in scripture is a difficult time in our life. It's often, it's often the place where there's battles and there's wars that go on in the valley. It's an illustration for a time of darkness, a time of despair. It's where we're most vulnerable when we're going through a valley. Most people, when they walk through the valley back in first century Palestine, there was there was opportunity to be robbed and to be mugged and to be assaulted, to be attacked is in the valley. It's where Satan wants you to be for him to attack you at your lowest and at your weakest. It's in the valley and maybe you're there today. And I find myself, sometimes there's parts of my life that might be on the mountaintop, but then there's this, this couple other parts that I find myself in the valley. And maybe that's you today. And I pray that God has a word for you today. In verse 5 of Psalm 84, blessed are those whose strength is in you, where our dependence is not in me, it's in, it's in God, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. To get to the city of Jerusalem, you had to go through this valley. To get to the city of refuge, to get to find ultimate peace, sometimes we have to go through the valley. Our prayer is, God, would you take me out of the valley? But oftentimes in scripture, it's God takes us through the valley. As they go through the valley of Baca, Baca refers to this weeping tree. When he walked by it, there was sap flowing out of it. It was always sticky and it looked like it was literally crying. And it was found in the valley of Baca, translated the valley of sorrow, the valley of tears, the valley of weeping. And you're like, you're asking yourself, what does this have to do with Christmas? God brings us through the valley. They make it a place of springs. 
So there's a promise here as we go through the valley that God says, you depend on me, you trust me. There's a, we make it a place of springs. What do you do when you're in the valley? You prepare yourself for God to bless you, for God to provide for you. you what they did in the valley is they dug a well. Even when it wasn't raining, even when it was dry, they dug a well to say, God, you are going to provide for me. I'm going to lean into you. I'm going to depend on you. I'm going to trust in you so that you will provide for me. God doesn't often take us out of the valley. He takes us through the valley. If you're, There's a passage David writes in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Some of us are in the valley right now. I think most of life is lived in the valley. It might be a financial situation. It might be a marriage. Your marriage is in the valley. It's a parenting situation. You, your marriage might be good, but it's your parenting relationship right now that's, that's in the valley. You have a son, you have a daughter you've been praying for, and you feel like that part of my life is in the valley. It might be job, career, it might be family drama, I went through that this, this past year. There's seven of us, kids. And out of seven of the kids, seven didn't get along. <laughs> we were batting a thousand. And this has been a several year journey of pain and heartache and hurt and awful things, things that happened 20 years ago, still holding on to. And so I was asked to reconcile, get everybody together and hash this out. And it was the worst Zoom call I've ever been on in my life. Everybody was yelling and screaming and we're all followers of Jesus. And I'm like, how is this happening? So painful and so hurtful. Maybe you can relate to relationships that you have in your life. I think of another time in my life, valleys that we've all been through. By God's grace, I'm not there anymore. There was a moment when I was in ministry as a youth pastor, was the, there was a great gathering of students and God moved and it was a highlight. I look back on that as one of the most powerful moments that God moved. And the very next day I had to go and sit in an elementary school with my little brother and my, my sister who was in junior high at the time and let them know that mom had just passed away. And the, you go from the mountaintop to the valley in, in just a minute, right? Most accidents happen or most injuries happen on the trail. It's not going up, it's coming down. Most injuries happen on the descent, and some of us are there today. We've been, we've been going down far, far too long. And we can relate to being in the valley. How do we know that God is still with us in the valley? Because we, he shows up and he makes it a place of, of spring. He provides water in the desert. But what's he asking us to do? Provide a well. Dig a well. It makes no sense. For some of us today, we just need to sit and wait for God to move, for God to show up. Now listen to this. They go from strength to strength. Prior to that, the early rain also covers it with pools. And they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. There was a, this past summer, I had the opportunity to ride my bike across the state of Iowa. I am not a biker, but it was, I'm a, I like to do things. And so if it's an opportunity to do something, I'm going to do it. It's bucket list I had is this big ride across the state of Iowa. And everybody's like, I can't believe you're riding your bike across the state of Iowa. I got a little secret to tell you. When, when we're riding, one of my little tricks was to, I get in a little Peloton. Peloton is a long list of, you know, group of 12 to 15 riders. And if you hop in the back end of that, you start going, oh my goodness. It's like you're moving with hardly very little work, <laughs> right? It's, it's similar to synergy when one horse, one horse can pull 8,000 pounds. And how many pounds can two horses pull? You would think 16,000 pounds, right? No, 24,000 pounds when two horses are working together. On that bike ride across the state of Iowa, I just kind of settled in and I found a group of people to follow and it felt like this is so much easier. But let me tell you, when I was all by myself in that wind, you got a headwind coming towards you and it's 100 degrees with 80% humidity, I wasn't moving very fast. I was stuck. I was waiting for somebody to come along. We are totally, I can't do anything on my own. 
As a follower of Jesus, I am completely, utterly dependent upon God in my life. He is my creator. I lean into him. Jesus says, seek me and you will find me. Some of us are in the valley today, but our focus should not be in the valley. Our focus and our mind should be on the mountaintop. That God loves you where you are today. If you are in the valley, I want you to know God loves you. He loves you so much. He's not going to leave you there. But it requires faith and it requires trust. They go from strength to strength. For some of us in the room today, it's just, what's the next thing God is asking you to do? to do. Each one appears before God to Zion. Ultimately, God's desire for you and I to live a life of peace. Ultimate peace. Do you have peace today? Do you have peace in your relationships? Do you have peace in your home? Is there peace in your marriage? You can't control every decision around you. You can't control the people around you. But you can find ultimate peace and joy in the person of Jesus. This idea of God with us, Emmanuel, I was thinking about this, and if you Google the incarnation, it's a big church word, incarnation, it means God with us. I thought, boy, how, how can we explain this? If you Google it and you look up definitions, they're so complicated and confusing. But how can we explain a very complicated term that a child could understand? And so go on a little journey with me. The relationship, a conversation that God the Father and God the Son might have had. Now, what I'm going to share with you is extra biblical. This is a little creative. Give me a little creative license here. What I'm going to share with you did occur, but the conversation, I don't know if it occurred or not. But imagine a father says to his son in heaven, the two members of the Trinity, before Jesus comes to earth, he says, son, there's only one way for us to redeem the people that we so desperately love and we want and long to have a relationship with them. There's only one way for this to happen and that's for you to go. You know you need to go. Yes, Father, I know I need to go. I'm, I'm gonna just give you a little insight into what's, how this is gonna go down. You're gonna have to spend nine months in a womb. And Jesus is like, really? Can we just do the stork? Just go the stork route? Do I really have to spend nine months in a womb? Yeah. It's really important that you do this because you're going to be born of, a, of mankind, so you're going to be born through Mary. You're going to have a wonderful mom. She's going to be really popular for thousands of years. They're going to build statues of her. She's a pure woman. She, she didn't play spin the bottle like all the other girls and truth or dare and make out in the back of the church van, right? She, she's the one who loves us and adores us, and she, we've chosen her for you to for you to begin your life. But you're also born of, of spirit. And so that's why Joseph, I've given you a great stepdad, an earthly father. I've given you a really good stepdad. He's a carpenter. In fact, you're going you're gonna to be a carpenter too. But I wanted to let you know that you're not going to be born where everybody thinks you're going to be born. They all think you're going to be born in a palace. And Jesus says, oh, I really like this because I'm not coming for the rich and the powerful and the righteous, right? And Father says, you're right, son. You're perfectly right. You're going to be born in a, in a barn with smelly animals and a very difficult situation. And you're going to grow up and there's going to be opportunities for you to exhibit your supernatural ability when you're taking a bath. You're, you have the ability to part the water there in the bathtub. Son, just take the bath. And there's going to be times you don't want to eat your broccoli, son. Just, just eat your broccoli. You're going to, there are going to be opportunities you have to exhibit your supernatural ability because you are fully God. But I want you to, for those seasons, lay that aside and be, be a boy. And you're going to do really well in school, son. You're going to get straight A's. The teachers are going to love you, but the fellow classmates are going to probably resent you. In fact, I want you to know, son, that your entire life, people are going to try to kill you. They will mock you. They will ridicule, ridicule you. The enemy wants to throw you off the mission. Son, I have a mission for you. If you're willing to accept it, here is your mission. To go, to seek, and to save those who are lost. That is your mission. It's going to be really easy to get off mission. Are you willing to do this? And Jesus says, yes, I'm, I'm willing to do this. Okay, I want to let you know the rest of the story. You're going to be a carpenter. You're going to follow in the footsteps of your earthly father for about... 28 years, you're going to follow 
as, as you're going to follow your, your father. You're gonna, not going to start your ministry for a while. You're going to create things because that's what we do in the Trinity. We, we create things. And as, as you do this, there's going to be an enemy who wants to throw you off your mission. And so what are you going to do, son, when, when the enemy comes to, to tempt you and to throw you off? Well, I'm going to use our word. Right, Father? I'm going to use the word of God. Yes, I'm going to, yes, that's right. When Satan comes to tempt you when you're in the wilderness with eating bread, you're going to say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yes, son, perfect. There's going to be many other opportunities for you to get thrown off course, and you're going to develop some really good friendships. You're going to have three years of some BFF, some 12 guys are going to hang with you, but I want you to know, be prepared. They're going to turn on you. They're going to leave you when you need them the most. Are you prepared for that? Yeah, thank you, thank you for letting me know that. I'm prepared for that. In fact, the one you love, one of the, your favorites is Peter. And Peter, man, he's really outspoken for you. He's going to be your best friend. And there's going to be a moment before you go to the cross where he's going to deny ever even knowing you. And he does so in front of an eight-year-old girl. Son, I, are you prepared for this? Yes, I'm, I'm prepared. Send me. And then toward the end of your life, I wanted to let you know what's, what's going to happen. The whole reason you're going to earth, the whole reason for this is that you would give your life as a ransom for us here today. And he says, I understand that. And son, you're going you're gonna to be taken. You're going to be beaten. You're going to be betrayed by those you thought loved you. You're going to be beaten beyond recognition. Your back's going to be lashed. You're going to have a crown of thorns placed on your head. And you're going to hang naked and ashamed on a cross for the world. You prepared for that? Yes. Now, in the garden, you're going to reach out. You're going to ask me, is there any other way? I want you to know that. There, there is, you can call 10,000 angels, Jesus, and I, it's my son, and I will send those to you. But I want you to know, stay the mission. I'm calling you. Christmas is all about Easter, right? For us in the room today, Christmas has everything to do with Easter. The whole reason Jesus came was so that he would, he would give his life. And there's going to be a moment in the garden before you go to the cross. You're going to be so intense in prayer. You're going to be sweating drops of blood. And you're going to cry out to me, is there any other way? And I want you to know, no, there is no other way. If we want to have a relationship with, with you, this is, this is what Jesus must do must do. And then I want you to know, son, I'm going to be with you every moment of your life, your earthly life. Every second, I'm going to be there for you until I can't. And when you die on that cross and you take your last breath, I, I can't be with you. I turn my back on you at that moment. I want you to know that that's going to be coming. I'll turn my back on you because you'll be taking the sin of all mankind upon you and I can't be in the presence of sin. He says, okay, I, I understand that. And so I'm, I'm going to, Father, I'm going to pray into my hands I commit my spirit. Yeah, do that. And Father, I'm going to pray for the forgiveness of those who persecute me and those who nailed me to the cross. Yeah, exactly. I want you to do that. You see, the I, I, reason I wanted to talk about being in the valley today, because I think most of life is in the valley for all of us. Jesus knows what it means to be in the valley. In fact, there's, there hasn't been a bigger valley and a deeper valley than the valley that Jesus left when he stepped out of heaven into the valley of earth. And every day of his life was a valley for him compared to where he's been and compared to where he is today. But he gave his life. The whole reason he came to earth was to seek and save that which was lost. What did Jesus, what's lost? You and me. In Matthew 1, the passage we read, the purpose, Jesus was to come to earth to save people from their sins. Jesus knows what it means to live in the valley. Love is not something just that God does. He doesn't just shout it from heaven to tell us that he loves us. He came. It's who he is. Love is who he is. He came to earth. And he lived a perfect life. And he stayed on mission. Son, do you know what the mission is? Yes, the mission is to seek and to save the lost. 
Do you know why you need to go? Do you understand the reason? Yes, because they're, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Okay, son, you're ready. You're ready. For those of us in the room today, some of us remember that moment we placed our faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. God says in his word, when we are in the valley, if you dig it, God will fill it. He also says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. If you seek me, you will find me. If you make room for me, I will reveal myself to you. You, you see, every one of us in this room, we're traveling. This is, not our, this is not our eternal home. I know it feels like right now this is, this is home. And nothing's going to change. All of us, eternity is coming f- f- toward us like a freight train. It's going to happen before we know it. We all have a choice to make. What are we going to do with the person of Jesus? Emmanuel, for those of us in the room today who are weak, he is our strength. If right now we feel like my life is in total total darkness, utter darkness, he is our light. If we're in trouble, he is with us as joy. If we are in pain, he is with us as our comforter. If we are in the valley, he is with us. If we are blessed, he is with us in the rejoicing. Some of us in the room, we're on the mountaintop. And everything's good right now. He is with us in our rejoicing. If we are alone, he is with us as a companion. If we are sick, he is with us in our healing. Wherever you find yourself today, Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. He is with you. What do you need today? He is with you. And if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, to say, I am dependent upon God. I trust Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. And I long to have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe who loves you and gave his life for you. Today can be that day. As we come to the close of this message, I just want to ask you, if you are in a season of valley right now, if there is a situation in your life where you feel like I'm in the valley of this and you could use prayer, would you just throw up your hand? You are in the valley currently. I want to pray for you. Just throw your hand up. Thank you. Father, you can place your hands down. Father, you know those who raise their hands and you see them and I pray, God, you would sit with them. I pray that you would comfort them. I pray that they would trust you. They would sit, they would dig a well and they would wait for you to bring them through the valley. God, you, we love to enjoy you on the mountaintop, but we, in, we get to know you on an intimate level through the valley in Jesus' name. I pray that you would show favor and kindness. I know this has been a very difficult year for some in the room today, God, and I pray that you would comfort them. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter because life is uncomfortable many times. I pray they would sense your power and your presence in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. If there are those in the room today who feel like They sense they would like God to sit with them, to be in the presence of God. If right now you feel like you need the presence of God, would you just slip up your hand? This morning, you're sensing like the presence of God to sit with you. For those of us in the room who've never placed our faith and trust in Jesus, today can be that day. You want to know who Jesus is as your as your savior, because here's the reality. Here's something every one of us have in common, and that's sin. Every one of us in this room, we've sinned, and we fall short of the glory of God. And if today's the day you want to place your faith and trust in Jesus, would you just simply raise your hand? I want to pray for you. We want to celebrate with that fact. I see the hand in the middle. Would you join me in prayer? And so, Father, for those in the room who today are placing their faith and trust in you, I pray that you would welcome them into your family. God, we all celebrate. New life has been born here in this room. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take a moment to celebrate with me, those who raise their hand. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. 
Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.